Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the past four weeks, we've been talking about the very real struggles that we all have to deal with in this life. We talked first about the struggle to find purpose. Why are we here? What is it that God is calling each one of us to do? We talked about what happens when our worlds collide, or in other words, the struggle to be authentic in every area of our lives. We talked about the struggle to deal with the violence in our world. How do we understand God in a world filled with violence? Last week, we talked about the struggle to tame our tongues. How do we make sure that the words we speak, the words we put on social media, and the words we tell ourselves in our heads are words of love and kindness? This week, we end the series with what I think is the hardest struggle of all. It is certainly in the top five questions that I get as a pastor, and that is the struggle to forgive. We did a sermon series a few years ago when I first got here on forgiveness, so um, some of what you hear today is going to be a repeat of that information, but I think that it's important enough that it's worth repeating. How do we forgive ourselves? How do we forgive others? And how do we receive and accept and understand the forgiveness of God? My new favorite description of the process of forgiveness comes from a little book called Forgive and Forget that was written by a man named Louis Smedes. He says this, this is how human beings forgive. We hurt, we hate, we heal. We hurt, that is, we allow ourselves to feel the depth of an injury that has been dealt to us. We don't minimize it or try to sweep it under the rug. We hate, that is, we blame the one who has hurt us. We don't condone or excuse the offense. And finally, when we are ready, we heal. We let go of the pain that is binding us to the past and move on. That is how we human beings forgive. Now, in his words, the process itself sounds pretty simple, but we know that it always happens inside a storm of complex emotions. Particularly when the wound is deep, forgiveness comes slowly and it fits and starts if it comes at all. Forgiveness, I think, is some of the hardest work that you and I will ever do. So where do we start? Well, first, I think in order to understand forgiveness, we have to understand why we need forgiveness. In one short word, the answer to that question is sin. We need forgiveness because we mess up. Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every day, you and I make mistakes. Sometimes they are small ones, and sometimes they are really big ones that cause others and ourselves very serious damage. They damage our relationship with our loved ones, with our coworkers, with ourselves, and sometimes even in our relationship with God. Some of the most emotional conversations I have with people are around forgiveness. They ask me things like, how do I forgive my loved one who has hurt me so badly? How can I be reconciled to the one I've wronged? How can I release this bitterness? Or how can I forgive myself? How do I let go of the burden that I've carried? Paul Tillich, who's one of my favorite theologians, says this, forgiveness is an answer, not just an answer, but the divine answer to the question implied in our existence. I always tell people at weddings that I think we use the word love wrong, that love in scripture is actually a verb, not a feeling that we get. And we're actually going to talk about that next week in next week's sermon. But I also think that we use the word forgiveness wrong because we make it sound like something easy and superficial. So much so that when people have a hard time either forgiving or accepting forgiveness, we make those people feel like they're missing something that everyone else has already figured out. When the truth is, forgiveness is anything but superficial and it is anything but easy. Dr. Thomas Long, a professor at Candler School of Theology, says it this way. 
Forgiveness in the New Testament sense is not a superficial event. It is not merely a willingness to let bygones be bygones or to throw up one's hands with a, ah, oh, forget it, life must go on attitude. In the New Testament, he says, forgiveness is about making what is tragically broken right again. Forgiveness is about a deep healing, a thorough repair of broken relationships, a removal of the poison that destroys love and harmony a restoration of wholeness and open trust. Forgiveness is saying with utter truthfulness, the wrong is now righted, and I no longer count this against you. We are not called to create forgiveness. That is beyond us and our capabilities. We are called instead to participate in a forgiveness given to us as a gift, the forgiveness, the grace that God gives us in Jesus Christ. Our readings from scripture this morning have much to say about forgiveness. In the second reading that we just read from Matthew, we have a parable in which the lead character makes a poor choice, which brings him to a dead end. Now, let me remind you one of the important things about parables. One of the important things about parables is, as I taught the children uh, in Sunday school a couple weeks ago, parables always have, do any of the kids remember? What do parables have at the end of them? Pop quiz, anybody remember? Emma? A surprise, that's right. There's always a surprise twist at the end. There's always something that um, sh doesn't really quite make sense about what Jesus says in the parable. So the kids are learning about the parables of the lost sheep and lost coins, and we talked about how in those parables it doesn't make sense that a woman searches all day for the lost coin and then throws a party spending more coins to celebrate finding the lost coin, right? That doesn't really make sense. So in this parable, there's also a surprise ending. We have the lead character who's made a poor choice that brings him to a dead end. He finds himself in debt to his master with no means to pay off the debt. It's too large for him to ever pay off. He knew this world of indebtedness very well, as do really all of us. Sometimes people spend too much, lose their perspective on what's really important in life and squander what resources they have, and people have not set aside uh, sometimes what they need for when accidents occur in uh, emergency situations. So whatever the situation was for this particular servant, he knew how things worked in a world of debt. When you can't pay, you either have to renegotiate or you end up in debtor's prison. So he asked his master for some kind of deal, any kind of deal, so that he could finally do the only thing he expected in the world he knew, pay what he owed. The master, however, surprisingly, surprises him by opening the door to a world about which he knew nothing. He introduces this servant to a debt-free world, a world in which debts could be forgiven. He tells the servant, in fact, that he would have to pay nothing. He doesn't say, leave and come back and try to pay it later. He says, leave, your debts are forgiven. So, of course, Jesus, in telling this parable, is introducing his hearers to the world of God's mercy. It is a world in which people don't have to do anything to earn or deserve God's affirming love. God gives because his heart is extravagantly kind. So understanding what this means and choosing to live within this world is a large order for each of us. Whether we can respond in kind is an open question, a bottom line question for each of us for whom Jesus tells this parable. Now, as we know from reading it just a few minutes ago, the story doesn't end there, right? Instead, the servant goes home, he leaves, and he goes out and finds someone else who is indebted to him, another servant. And he tells that servant, pay up, and when he can't, he has that servant thrown in jail. The other servants, their other friends, report this, and the tables are turned for the servant who accepted so freely the master's forgiveness, but who himself couldn't forgive others. He himself gets to experience the same lifestyle with which he is stuck, the one of which he can't seem to let go. He was offered a world with no debt, but he goes out and calls people around him to stay living in that world of indebtedness. In effect, Jesus is saying there is a lifestyle which deals with debts and indebtedness, and there is another in which debts are not an issue because forgiveness in that lifestyle sets you free. 
Surprising as it is, he says, you have a choice to live in one or the other. In the parable that Jesus tells, the unforgiving servant chooses to go back to the only world he knows, the world he knows best, the one ruled by debts and indebtedness. Now, for some of us, this is a hard parable to hear, because at the end, it seems to talk about a God who vacillates between being kind and being mercenary, or at least between being kind and expecting you to merit his kindness. But those are just details along the way. One of the other important things about parables is to know that you can't do an exact for exact metaphor in all of them. Sometimes there are pieces of it that are just um, details that aren't as important. The bottom line of the parable is that a man made his choice to live in a world where indebtedness was the common currency, and that was a dead-end street. And that, the parable wants us to know, is a question now placed before each one of us. What kind of lifestyle will you choose for yourself? Do you know how to live the life that sets you free? The Greek word for forgiveness literally means letting go. So I want you to imagine that I have a, an imaginary ball in my hand that I'm hanging on to very, very tightly. Obviously, it's a very small ball because I have small hands. So I want you to think about forgiveness as letting go. Letting go of the anger, letting go of the resentment, letting go of the hurt that lives within our hearts. And what happens when we are able to let it go is that our hands are able to be open for God's work. I read this week another analogy that I thought was um, really fitting and really funny. So it's about um, trapping monkeys. And I think this analogy can help us to understand forgiveness as letting go. So the illustration goes like this. If you want to trap monkeys out in the jungle, what you do is you drill holes into the coconuts that are lying in the ground. And so a monkey comes up and slips his hand through the drilled holes in the coconut and grabs the white meat inside the coconut. And as he grabs the meat, his hand will expand. So the hand becomes stuck and trapped inside the coconut. <clears throat> And the same thing happens with the other hand and then the two feet. He tries to grab coconuts and he tries to grasp onto the meat. And so both hands and both feet have grabbed onto and are tightly grasping the coconut meat. So the monkey is then trapped. He's yours if you want him. The monkey has to let go of the meat in his hands and feet in order to become free. Forgiveness means to let go. To let go of the anger, to let go of the resentment, the bitterness, and the hurt that we feel in our hearts and that we hang on to for far too long. I read another old saying this week about anger and hatred. Maybe you've heard it. It says this, to nurture our anger and hatred is like drinking poison, hoping that it is going to kill the other person. And yet all it does is kill us and separate us from God's love. Henry Nouwen says the same thing, but he says it this way, to forgive another person from the heart is an act of liberation. It is an act of liberation. We set that person free from the negative bonds that exist between us. We say to them, I no longer hold your offense against you, but there is more. We also free ourselves from the burden of being the offended one. When we do not forgive those who have wounded us, we carry them with us, or worse, we pull them as a heavy load. The great temptation is to cling in anger to our enemies and then define ourselves as being offended and wounded by them. Forgiveness, therefore, liberates not only the other but also ourselves. Forgiveness is the way to freedom for the children of God. Listen to that again. Forgiveness is the way to freedom for the children of God. That's the choice the parable gives us. The life of freedom through forgiveness, both receiving and giving, or a life of indebtedness, a dead end of bitterness, resentment, and anger. Think about it one more way. When we refuse to forgive ourselves, we cut ourselves off from our relationship with God. When we choose to hold on to guilt or feelings of unworthiness or resentment of any kind, we are denying God's grace into our lives and refusing to allow grace to transform us into the people God has called us to be. We are sinners, all of us, every one of us, but we are forgiven sinners through the amazing and wonderful grace of God in Jesus Christ.
So think about it this way. What he's saying at the end of the parable is how can we truly ask God to forgive us if we aren't willing to forgive ourselves? What good does it do if God offers us grace and forgiveness like the master offered his servant, yet our hearts are closed to receive it because we think, for whatever reason, that we and those around us are unworthy, that we don't deserve God's grace freely given to us? So here's the other thing to know about forgiveness in scripture. The Bible insists on both repentance and forgiveness. In Luke's version of this same text for today from Matthew, Luke doesn't mention the phrase 70 times seven, but he does insist upon repentance as a part of forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness belong to each other. They are two sides of the same coin. Forgiveness becomes cheap forgiveness when it is not accompanied by true repentance. Repentance means literally to turn around, to walk the other way. So if a person does not change their behavior in a relationship but keep on whining that I'm sorry but never actually change their behavior, to forgive them repeatedly is to condone their behavior. Forgiveness requires repentance. Jesus' answer to the question, how many times we should forgive, is not meant to be an exact answer. Like I told the children, we're not supposed to actually finish that math problem. But rather, it's meant to say to us, you are to forgive an endless amount of times. We live, friends, in a world where people like to keep track of and to tally up our mistakes. We also live in a very litigious society in which we like to hold others responsible for things. We like to ask questions like, who is to blame when some kind of accident occurs? Or we've been taught things like, someone has to pay. And all of those things are true if you live in the kind of world of indebtedness that that slave lived in. In a world of debt, nobody gets away with anything. But in the kind of life which Jesus introduces us to, freedom is at the heart of everything. A freedom that permeates his life and his death. Remember in his final moments as Jesus was on the cross, we who know all about indebtedness might have expected him to cry out, who is responsible for this? The Romans, the Jews, the Pharisees, the people who said and did nothing, the ones who shouted my name, my father in heaven. Instead, we hear him cry out just the opposite. As he's hanging on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he doesn't specify who that forgiveness is for. He offers it to everybody. It is this emancipating perspective, the ability not to have to hold on to others with some chain of indebtedness, which not only sets us free from bondage to hatred and jealousy and frustration and greed, but also opens the future to us. And this perspective is, I think, at the heart of our Christian faith. Endless forgiveness makes no sense to our human way of thinking, but without it, we can never live the kind of open-ended lives that Christ calls us to. Being a Christian, being a disciple, following Christ, involves us having to make daily decisions between an older, dead-end way of doing things and an eternally new, open-ended possibility. The story of Jesus' death and resurrection reminds us that these issues were so critical for the one whom we call Lord and Master that he allowed those who insisted on blaming someone for trouble and danger and blasphemy in their world to take out their revenge upon him. And then, surprise of surprises, at the end, he forgives them for it because he wanted to be free of hatred and he wanted to set them free of guilt. In his example, we are given new life and new possibility. In the parable that he tells us today, we too are asked the question, how do you want your life to turn out? Would you prefer to live in freedom or bondage? Which world do you choose? One of endless debtedness or one of endless forgiveness, of freedom, of mercy, and of grace? So how do we choose the way of freedom? Well, first we remember, 
We remember the vital truth that we belong to God, that God loves us, that God showers us with grace and mercy. We remember that we ourselves are already a forgiven people, forgiven daily by God for the mistakes that we made. We remember Jesus' forgiveness offered that day so many years ago on the cross. And then we pray. We pray asking God to help us forgive. We pray asking God to help us want to forgive. We pray asking God to help us want to want to want to forgive. We pray asking God to help us feel his forgiveness. We remember and we pray and we remember and we pray some more. And we continue to do so until God continues to work on our hearts little by little until one day we wake up and find that we are forgiven and that we can forgive. And then we give thanks. We give thanks for the one who's forgiven us and for the one who has taught us how to forgive. We give thanks that we have been changed and transformed and welcomed into a new world, one not filled with indebtedness, but filled with freedom, with mercy, with grace, and with endless possibility. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.